Um, I am delighted to be here, delighted to be almost in Elgin, um, actually, and to talk today about uh, my new book, which is called Chicago in Illustrated Timeline. Oh my, we're having this problem again, that it's not moving. Oh, no, uh -oh. oh, sorry, okay. go back, try it again. Um, I don't, okay. Um, an illustrated timeline, like my book, is highlights important milestones. And I think you all know what the important milestones are in a person's lives. You know, birthdays, graduations, uh, religious rites like marriage or funerals, commun communion, uh, family traditions, uh, or other. Um, the book about Chicago tells the same kind of story uh, with 140 dates and milestones. And I picked those 140 dates because of the events where the, there's a long-term impact on the city, where there are geographic influences, economic, or social, sociological changes, political events. And then because as Sadia said, I am a docent at the Architecture Center, I followed the progress of architectural design. But the gist of the book is photos, illustrations, maps, and charts like you see, um, like you see here. So what are Chicago's milestones? Well, if you go with Chicago's flag, and let me say that when the flag was adopted in 1917, there are only two stars on it. And they add stars as uh, the city fathers think that something is important. So over the years, they have added two more and the four stars that are on the Chicago flag today are uh, talking about Fort Dearborn, which is here in the lower left-hand corner, 1803. It was established by the federal government, one of the, the um, forts that was right on what was then the Western edge of the United States. And it was there for protection from whoever was going through. Protection from what? Well, protection, they said, from the Native Americans, although the peoples who lived here um, were not very uh, warlike and were welcoming rather than negative towards the, uh, towards the settlers. Uh, the 1871 fire, which you can see in the middle, when the, most of the downtown area and the, and the north section of the city was totally burned. Um, the 1893 Columbian Exposition, which was a, the first World's Fair here in Chicago, and it showed that Chicago had built itself up from the era of the fire. And then um, the US, the uh, 1933 Century of Progress World's Fairs. These are the four things that the city so far has felt were the most important. But my book, I think, goes beyond because I think Chicago has a lot more to say about going beyond those traditions. Um, and that includes the people who are here. Uh, we had the indigenous peoples. This is the homeland of the um, Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwa, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. And the, then another 15 or so tribes, including the Illini, the Fox, and the Sauk. Uh, they were here first. They, uh, it is their land that we are on. And uh, in 1833, we pushed them out forcibly. This was not a, uh, an idea that they had that they'd like to leave. Then we have um, a wave of uh, the first white settlers who are called Yankees or Euro-Americans followed by waves and waves of European immigrants, black migrants from the South who come to the North and Latinx and Asian immigrants all make up the story of the city of Chicago. And then of course, we've got politics. We, uh, I'm sure you recognize Harold Washington and down in the corner on the left-hand side, uh, our first mayor daily, Richard J. Um, Plus the whole story about economics. What did we do in industrialization? What did we do about labor? 
And finally, um, I include architecture. The building on your far right is, um, and actually I should get myself out of here. Um, the, the building on the far right is one of our newest skyscrapers. It's called St. Regis um, and is the third tallest building in Chicago, the tallest building in the world designed by a woman architect. And then finally, um, there's a lot of stuff in the book about sports, simply because Chicago is a sports crazy town, and a lot of stories. There's a story there about the statehood miracle. The reason we're not all cheeseheads is because of a guy who said, you know, I don't think the line for the state should go at the bottom of Lake Michigan. We should push it up about 36 miles. Ergo, Chicago gets into Illinois and doesn't stay in, in Wisconsin. There's the story of the Lager Beer Wars in 1850, when the mayor of Chicago, whose name was Levi Boone, and yes, he was related to, to Daniel Boone, um, he was his grand nephew. Levi Boone was a, a Baptist who believed in um, no alcohol. He was a prohibitionist. And um, the German and Irish immigrants who made up two thirds of his city were not happy with the idea of not drinking beer on Sunday, their only day off. And there was a war between the immigrants and the um, police. This war took all of five minutes, but each group was marching along and they got to the uh, Clark Street Bridge and um, Mayor Boone had the bridge move and it threw the emigrants down to their feet. The police picked them up, took them to jail. Um, it's the story of our bridges over the river. Chicago has more um, movable bridges than any other city in the United States and only is after Amsterdam in the world. It's the story about bungalows. It's the story about music from gospel to blues to jazz about our theaters, about our radio, about TV, which started here in Chicago, about the movie industry that started here in Chicago. And I do get into Al Capone and gangsters, not my favorite topics, but they are part of that woof and weave that go together that makes Chicago. So um, you were promised 12 different dates of things that are highly important to Chicago. And here are the, uh, here's the list of what I'm going to really talk about today, plucking from the book what I think are the milestones that actually changed and created Chicago. Six of them happened in the 19th century. One is the forced removal of the indigenous people. Two is the development of transportation and industrialization. Three is the fire. Four is our European immigration. Five is the 1893 World's Fair, the second industrial revolution and labor unrest. And then six, the golden age of architecture. I'm gonna elaborate on each one of these as we go through, but I also have six milestones in the 20th century. The reversal of the Chicago River, the great migration, the race riots of 1919, the election of Anton Cermak, which is the um, very important in political terms, the 1950s suburbanization, the time that makes Elgin change from a market town to a suburb. And uh, I'm gonna end with the 1955 election of Richard J. Daley. So let's talk about Chicago prior to 1833. As I said, it was the land of indigenous peoples and it sat along what is a, a marshy, slow moving river that the Native Americans used for transportation. Their canoes could get through, go up and down and they had trading all along uh, the river. In fact, the indigenous peoples, the Illini in this case, uh, gave the name to the river. They called it Chicago. 
Shikagum is uh, means onions, the allium family of plants that were growing all around the river because it was such a, a slow marshy uh, slog. Those allium plants, which include wild garlic, wild onions, leeks, and all of that, smelled a little bit. And the word Chicago means stinky onion. So really the name of Chicago is Stinky Onion, Illinois. Um, the peoples who were here of the various tribes, uh, the majority of whom were Potawatomi, were farmers. As you notice in the upper right-hand corner, there's a woman who is uh, planting corn and fertilizing it by putting other uh, herbs and off and sometimes fish into the into the um, into the dirt. These people were here when our first non-indigenous settler arrived. His name is Jean Baptiste Pont du Sable. He is pictured in the lower right hand corner of the screen. Um, Jean Baptiste du Sable was married to a Potawatomi woman whose name was Kitua. And they settled right down at the mouth of the Chicago River. And he opened up a trading post to trade with both whites and Native Americans. Highly successful from one trading post before long, he had a whole estate with a house and barns and corn cribs and chicken coops and, and, uh, and barns and silos. He was quite successful. We really don't know what he looks like, but this is taken from the one drawing that we have in history of his, of his face. Uh, he was French, Haitian, spoke French, and his father was African. Uh, by, 18, uh, by the 1803, he and his wife had moved, but that was the beginning of white settlement in the, in the area. And in 1833, the government of the United States of America signs a series of treaties with the indigenous peoples, which pushes the indigenous peoples to the west over into the west beyond the Mississippi River. This was done forcibly. They made the Indians drunk before they signed. Everybody didn't quite understand what was included. The Indians idea of what is land ownership was very different from the whites idea and the whites said you are selling your land. The Native Americans most likely thought that they were selling the right to use the land because to them the land belonged to everyone. This is the first major uh, date, however, of what happens that allows Chicago to grow. Now, fast forward, and we begin to get the development of transportation and industrialization. And what do I mean by that? Well, the railroads show up here in 1850. The first railroad is the Galena, uh, the Chicago and Galena Railroad. Galena is the place where they were mining lead. And the railroad was supposed to run from Galena, which is in the Western part of the state of Illinois, down to uh, Chicago. It never really made it that far. They just got a portion of it done here in Chicago in 1848. But afterwards, they begin to get it all through. And as you probably know, Chicago is the railroad hub of the United States, was the railroad hub of the United States then, and stands to it today. We're third in the world for railroad trackage. The other thing that starts is the development of the Chicago River, whereas the Native Americans solely used it for trading and going up and back, uh, we begin to build what is on the left-hand side of your screen, um, a lot of buildings along there that are, these are grain elevators that you see. These ships came in with lumber from Wisconsin and, and Michigan. They came in from grain from uh, um, the West. At what, by 19, I'm sorry, by 1870, we are going to have done more shipping in, um, uh, in a year than New York, San Francisco, and New Orleans combined. We were the number one port in America. 
Uh, the third thing that happens, and, and the, re the reason that it happens here in Chicago is because they connect in 1848, they connect the Chicago River to the Des Plaines River, which allows transportation from the Great Lakes all the way to the Mississippi River and down to New Orleans. Chicago becomes the hub of east-west transportation by, um, by boat. And it kind of kicks out St. Louis, which at that time was the king of boat transportation, but they were running north and south along the Mississippi. This creates a new east-west route. Now, at the same time, um, we have the beginning of industrialization. And this is a picture of the McCormick Reaper plant uh, prior to the, um, to the 1871 fire. Uh, this is uh, the beginning of industrialization. It's uh, uh, agricultural equipment, and it too is on the river, uh, together with tanneries, with cheese factories, with candy companies. Everybody's going along the river, which is why for a very long time, the Chicago River was so polluted, they called it toxic. Now in 1871, most of the city burns. Uh, the map on the upper right is the map of the what they called the burnt district. The city itself was six miles long, and this is four miles from north to south. North is on the right hand side. South is on on the uh, on the left. Uh, west is to the top of the pay of the map and east is on the bottom. So you have to kind of orient yourself that way. Uh, the whole downtown burned, most of the north side, and then a little bit of the west side, which was where Mrs. O'Leary's barn. Uh, to be perfectly honest, we're all celebrating 150 years of the fire. I just want to clarify, the barn is where the fire started. Mr. and Mrs. O'Leary, Catherine and Patrick, O'Leary owned the barn, but that was Mrs. O'Leary's dairy. There were not one cow in the, uh, in the barn who kicked over a lantern. There were six cows in the barn and a calf. The calf is the only one that survives. Mrs. O'Leary herself was in bed when all of this happened and wasn't awakened until the fire had started at nine o'clock at night on October 8th, 1871. The, the barn is where it starts. And then if you follow on your right-hand side, follow that picture from the left-hand side of the map all the way down, you see it goes north and east. The wind blew, it burned for 30 hours. The city is devastated. On your left hand side, you know, there aren't many pictures of the fire. There are a lot of pictures of what happened afterwards of the burn, but there's not many pictures of the fire itself. This is actually an art piece that's down on the river walk done by an artist by the name of Ellen Lanyon, which is showing the fire department here in silhouette right in the main part of the picture, going towards the bridge where everybody's running to get out of the downtown to cross the river and get to the north side. And the back on the, uh, on the right-hand side of this picture is the water tower, one of only six or eight buildings that actually survived the fire. And then all the rest of the people who are just scattered. Uh, the, uh, the fire left 300 people dead, 100,000 people homeless. And um, it just, devastated the entire city. A lot of people sent out messages and said, Chicago's done, this is it, this is the end of it. But Chicago rose again, and they certainly did. One of the things that happens in the city is that we begin to increase population on a massive scale. In the latter half of the 20th, uh, I'm sorry, of the 19th century, we uh, go from 100,000 people probably right after the Civil War to 1900 when we are a million and a half. It just grows exponentially and much of it is due to European immigration. So um, this began actually a lot earlier, 1840. 
the Irish start coming who are fleeing the potato famine. In the 1850s and 60s, Germans and Italians come. They weren't really Germans then. There wasn't a country Germany, but they came from Bavaria or they came from Hamburg or they came from Cologne. They came from different countries. Um, the Italians came. There, were no, there was no Italy prior to 1870, uh, but they came from Sicily or they came from Tuscany, or they came from Puglia, which is the, the area around the boot of Italy. And they came to Chicago and they lived in these wooden tenements and they were pushed in together in crowded areas with very poor uh, plumbing and um, not much heating. And they lived, families lived in two room houses. Women often worked out of their house, but this was, uh, a huge influx of people. I have 1872, but there are other dates as we go. Uh, the uh, Eastern Europeans begin to come in the 1890s. The Russian Jewish immigration is towards the end of the 1890s. Um, and through that also, we have a, a small, but we still have a, a, an Asian immigration and the beginning of, of Chinatown. So here on the left is an Italian family. A family usually included mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, uh, when the kids got married and their children. And very often they would all live in one building, mom and dad on one floor, grandma and grandpa on another, and in the area that we call Little Italy, uh, which is along Taylor Street. Maxwell Street is just uh, very near, and this is the Jewish uh, um, area where a lot of the Jews who had no English to help them out um, just went into peddling goods, either on their back walking through the city or at the market at the marketplace. And then in 1893, we had the great uh, uh, World's Columbian Exposition, which you see on your left. Uh, this was the uh, beginning of showing the world that Chicago was a cosmopolitan city. You, you counted us out with the fire, but look at where we are now. And they just absolutely burst their buttons about Chicago. They did enough bragging, in fact, that that's why we're called the Windy City, because they said the people were full of hire when we talked about how wonderful Chicago is. Um, this is the Ferris wheel from the fair. It's the first Ferris wheel in the United States. It was designed by a guy by the name of Ferris, uh, George Ferris. He actually was an Illinoisan, but he uh, was working in Pittsburgh at the time. And uh, he, he wrote in and said, you're having a fair. I would like to do something extra special and bring you what I conceive to be as an observation wheel. The people at the fair were delighted to hear about this because the previous World's Fair, which had been in Paris, had unveiled the Eiffel Tower. And they wanted to beat Paris with something better. They wanted to out Eiffel, Eiffel. So this is what's gonna do it. Uh, if you notice, those uh, cabs are very wide. This is not six or eight people in a, in a cab. These uh, cabs were as big as school buses and they held 60 people. So the way it worked was you got onto a cab and then it started filling up. It took 20 minutes to fill the entire um, uh, Ferris wheel. And then you had a 20 minute ride after it was all filled. So you really were up there for close to 40 minutes if you were at the beginning. Um, this wheel is, is uh, dismantled after the fair. It's put up on the north side of Chicago in what was going to be an amusement park. It was not financially successful. They disassembled it again, and it ends up in St. Louis at the next World's Fair in the United States, um, which is in 1903. That's the fair where um, the movie with uh, Judy Garland and um, Mickey Rooney, me, me in St. Louis, Louis, that one, um, that comes after it. And then when that fair is done, the, the, the wheel is put apart. To give you some idea of how tall this is, 
the Ferris wheel that is on Navy Pier now is two thirds of its size. This was a third again higher than that. Up here on the left hand side of your screen are the uh, lights that went in. Uh, the fair was electrified. It was called the White City because they whitewashed all the buildings. They didn't have time to paint them. And then they illuminated them every night and it was wonderful to see the White City. It ran for an entire summer. It brought in 27 million people. Now think about that in a city of 1 million, it brought in 27 million. People realized Chicago was a cosmopolitan city. It should be on everybody's map. It wasn't as big as New York, but it was a great second city. Now at the same time that we're doing that, Chicago becomes known for its labor uh, organization and its labor unrest. Uh, the first major unrest is the railroad strike, then the Haymarket riot, 1886. And finally, uh, this is Pullman, where they made sleeping cars for the railroads. Um, these three strikes were all involved about uh, having eight hour days, not being overworked, trying to get half a day off on Saturday, not using child labor. And in the case of Pullman, there was an added uh, aspect to the labor organization. These men lived in Pullman as well as worked there. George Pullman had built a model village and people went home to really, at that point in time, when some of the best housing that they could imagine. In the 1890s, um, when there was a recession, George Pullman was forced to cut prices on his railroad cars in order to sell them. So he cut wages, but he didn't cut rents. He owned the homes they lived in and he, and he extracted from those workers the same amount of money as before he cut their wages. So they went on strike in 1894. Um, all three of those strikes uh, did not result in success for the laborers but they did result in um, uh, uh, later on, there are rules passed about eight hour days, no child labor and the kinds of rules that we know, uh, we know from today. Oh, come on, come on. This is not pushing again, okay. Now the last part of the, of the 19th century, um, I have two parts because I think the golden age of architecture starts in two different ways. On your left hand side is the Reliance building. This building was built in 1893. The architect here is um, uh, Charles Atwood. And this is the beginning of what is ultimately going to become our skyscraper successes. This building is already uh, being done in 75% uh, of it is in glass. People are working in buildings where we have windows, they're getting their air and light out of the window. The building is going up more than 10 stories. It's utilizing an elevator and it is the precursor of the kinds of buildings that you see in the same picture on the right-hand side that are gonna come later and, and go up. Um, this is a as what we would call an iconic, meaning a best example building uh, of what is considered the Chicago commercial style of building, which is a base. That's all the granite area, the dark area, and then a repeating shaft or column of repeating floors. And then up on the top is a cornice. And the materials that are used here is terracotta. It's a clay that you put in the um, kiln and you cook for two days at a very high temperature. It's fireproof. And Chicago begins to build tall, fireproof with metal frames. And we're gonna, it, it's gonna end up that the last of the, of the tall talls is gonna be Sears, Sears Tower. On the other side, on the residential side, on the right-hand side, is um, Frank Lloyd Wright's 
this is Roby House, but Frank Lloyd Wright and his designs, um, which bring about a whole change in how we live. We go from Victorian houses, which are tall, lots of steps, each room has a function, to an open plan, horizontal styles that reflect the prairie and eliminate uh, most of the space that the Victorian houses used to provide for servants. Because America is changing, Chicago is changing just like it. We don't have servants in our houses anymore. We want more fluid in and out. And I think you can see this is the godfather, so to speak, of what becomes the ranch house, the bi-level, the tri-level, all of what we would call suburban, suburban living. And I think, as you know, that Oak Park is the main area for Frank Lloyd Wright houses, but Chicago has the second largest collection of Frank Lloyd Wright homes uh, and buildings in the United States. Okay, we're getting to the um, 20th century. So uh, Sadi, if there is any question, I'd be happy to answer it. I do see one, um, Ellen. It's, uh, someone's asking about what is the Western boundary of the fire? Okay, very good question. The Western boundary of the fire is, um, uh, if you know, there's the river, there's Halstead Street, and there's an Ashland as you're going west. And about there it ended. Um, it was more prairie, and so there wasn't anything for the fire to burn. The fire actually ends north at Fullerton for the same reason. And then on Tuesday, uh, the rain starts. So between the rain and not have any, anything to burn, um, the fire is out. A lot of people go west because they know they can just sit in the prairie area that hasn't been developed yet and, um, and they're safe. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, okay. That was the only question. Okay, oh. great. So we'll keep going. So in 1900, the city of Chicago takes a move that is considered the one of the um, engineering marvels of the 20th century. We reverse the flow of the river. So what's involved there? Well, the flow of the river up until 19 and uh, up until January of 1900 was to go right into the lake. So all those factories I've been talking about, all that transportation I've been talking about, everybody is dumping their garbage, their waste, their used water. You know, they bring the water in and then they do tanning and then they just shove that waste water out. The, the river is really dirty, it's filthy. Um, and, and as I said earlier, it, it becomes almost toxic. Um, as a result, the city of Chicago suffers from cholera, from uh, tetanus, uh, uh, diphtheria, and all sorts of waterborne illnesses because we get our drinking water out of the lake. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that if you're pouring dirty water and dirty waste and all that stuff into the river and the river runs into the lake and you're taking your drinking water from the lake, you're drinking dirty water. So the city tried to do things from all the way back in the 1850s. They knew this was wrong. They, they set up sewers that did some help, but not enough. They set up pumps to try and divert the water. That didn't work at all. That, that scheme was uh, just unrealistic. Um, they tried to put the pipe out into the lake to go further and further to get it away from the water that was just coming from the river. But particularly when it rained and the waves moved around, it didn't help. They were still taking dirty water in. So um, starting in 1890, they start on a new project, which is ultimately going to solve their problem. They dig a ditch. They dig a ditch that is deeper than the south branch of the river, and they build it right next to the south branch. Today, we call that the sanitary and ship canal. Um, because it's deeper, when they find it, it took them 10 years to dynamite their way and, and at pickaxe their way through this to get the whole ditch done. Uh, and in 1900, in January, when they open up the locks, the water starts running through by gravity. And so now the Chicago River runs from the north where it starts up in uh, near Zion, Illinois, all the way on down through the city of Chicago 
and out the other way to the Des Plaines River, the Illinois River, and the Mississippi. And water from the lake runs into the Chicago River and again down the Des Plaines, the Illinois, and then the Mississippi. This is, as I said, an engineering marvel. The techniques that they had, they um, used again at the Panama Canal. Uh, and um, it was con considered really something phenomenal. There was just one group who didn't agree. And those are the people in St. Louis because the wastewater was being shipped down in that direction. They took us to the Supreme Court and sued and said, you can't send dirty water down here. But they lost because the uh, Supreme Court said by the time the water got all the way down to St. Louis, just the roiling of the water alone had cleaned it up and St. Louis didn't have a case. Besides which the thing had already happened. There wasn't much they were gonna do about it. Um, so today, the, it, whatever goes up and down the river can go all the way down uh, to the Mississippi, down to New Orleans if you want. But as I think you're aware, the Chicago River has changed from a freight highway to a recreational highway because in 1909, we removed all, all most of the freight and pushed it down to what is today the port of Chicago on Lake Calumet in the Calumet River. All right, one of the biggest influences in the city of Chicago is the Great Migration, which was a massive movement of millions of people from the south to the north. Um, as you can see from the two maps, um, Chicago with its big orange dots increased more than many of the other cities uh, in the United States. The first migration uh, begins in 1910, which it, it just begins as a as a, a trickle, but by the time we get to World War I in 1915, large numbers of black workers are coming up to Chicago um, and they're going to take the place of the white workers who went off to World War I in 1917. When they come back, there's gonna be problems and we'll talk about that in, in a minute. Um, in the 1930s, we get massive movements of um, African Americans to the north to get away from the sharecropping and some of the other um, indignities of the South, including lynching and um, financial slavery, where, where they, the land that they owned and the work that they'd done was all connected to one person who then would tell them at the end of every harvest that they hadn't made enough money to make any progress. Um, the second migration starts with when we get gearing up for World War II and for all of the workers who are gonna be needed in the defense plants that are uh, established up here. Again, we're one of the big red, um, uh, big red um, circles on the map. And um, it's all contained in one area until uh, the, uh, uh, the 1940s, the end of the war, um, it's all contained in an area today we call Bronzeville. And this is the statue that meets you as you enter Bronzeville um, between 29th and 30th Street on Martin Luther King Drive. Um, this, is, this is a walking man. If you look carefully on the base of the picture, you'll see he's made out of soles, S-O-L-E-S, the soles of your shoes. And he's made up like that because a lot of people walked a long portion of these uh, migrations. Then a lot of them got on the Illinois Central Railroad. Um, and his suitcase, if you notice, is all tied up uh, with, with his goods. Um, this is by Allison Stores. And it's, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a piece of public art uh, today. The fact that we had an African-American community very much um, uh, makes the city of Chicago. And what happens in 1919 uh, solidifies a lot of what was very informal segregation in the city into some very stratified segregation. So first, let me put, let me set the stage here. If you look at the map on the right, um, it was a summer day and uh, there's a beach down at the bottom. 
there was an imaginary line between the white beach and the black beach. It was not set up. There was no sign. This was not on law, a law. Um, this was just an informal thing. And a young black man on a raft drifted over into the white side of the beach. He was stoned to death from white bathers who took stones and um, and lobbed them at him and pushed him off the um, off the raft and he drowned. That incident spurred an awful lot of um, unrest in the area that we call Bronzeville. Bronzeville was an area where all the blacks settled because of the informal segregation of the city. We had restrictive covenants, things that are on your deed that say you cannot rent to Negroes, Greeks and Italians, for example, or you cannot rent to Negroes or Jews. And so everywhere else, except in Bronzeville, which is, if, you're, if you know Chicago, it's the space between 29th and 52nd along State Street, all the way over to the lake. Um, there, there were no restrictive covenants. You could live there. And so all Blacks lived there. They created their own downtowns on 35th Street, on 47th Street, 49th Street. Um, and this hit the Black community hard because a lot of them, as you see in the picture on the left, a lot of them had gone to war for the United States. They had gone to Europe. They were fighting for freedom. Um, when they got there, John Pershing wasn't interested in using Black troops, so he lent them to the French, and they fought on the French campaign. Most of them got the Croix de Guerre, which is a French um, award. And um, they came back to the United States and they thought they were gonna be treated more equally, which they were not. So for seven days, there was a riot going on in this area. There were police, there were the black veterans who put their uniforms back on to try and maintain the police. It is a very different kind of riot than we are usually used to. It was as much whites on black as it was black on white. Um, at the end of this riot, the city pulls apart. Nothing, nothing has happened. It's just they create a quiet. But this begins where it is obvious that the city is going to be segregated by race and the, that the lines are going to be drawn extremely strongly and that we harden our relationship. Now, in 1945, restrictive covenants are considered um, are de declared to be illegal and Blacks begin to move out in other areas of the city, primarily on the South side. Um, but this, this race riot is a real, um, like a, 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 a dividing line of between where we were when it was kind of fluid and where we are um, afterwards. Now, I'm, I'm realizing I'm going a little too, not going fast enough to get done. 1932, there is an important mayoral election. The man in the middle is Anton Cermak, or as he would say, Chermak, and he is elected. He's an immigrant. He came to the United States and when he was two years old, um, and he was accused of being an immigrant in the election. He ran against Big Bill Thompson, who was a Republican, and Thompson said, you can't trust him. He wasn't born here. Uh, Chermak's response was, I came as fast as I can. Anton Cermak took the Democratic machine and made it into what we know today as the Democratic machine, a combination of African-Americans, immigrants, and, and blue-collar whites. He pulled it together. He is the first Democrat that we're going to see. And he is, uh, Big Bill Thompson is the last Republican mayor of the city of Chicago. Very quickly on the left, I have Oscar DePriest. He is the first black representative to Congress from a Northern area ever in the 19 teens. And he was a Republican because that was the, um, that was the party of Abraham Lincoln. Anybody who wanted to be um, uh, African-American had to, uh, to go along with the party of Lincoln. And what Cermak does is he takes that black party that the priest was a member of and he pulls those blacks into the Democrats 
in the 1930s. Okay, uh, you know about the um, depression, I'm sure. Uh, the Antler Planetarium opened up in the with the 1933 World's Fair, uh, uh, which wasn't nearly as important as the earliest fair because everybody was having fairs. It was a way to employ workers during the depression. It was a way to give people some semblance of fun and games during a really depressing era. And then the lower picture is, uh, this is Meg's Field. This becomes the international uh, airport for the city of Chicago. We enter World War II, we industrialize. Um, and the next big numbers I think that are important um, are what I mentioned earlier. This is the 1950s suburbanization of this area. I'm sure you're all well aware. This is when Elgin and Aurora and Waukegan and Joliet ceased to be just separate little towns. They started out as market towns, grew up, but now they're part of a suburban uh, area. And at the same time, we get O'Hare Airport, which brings us into the um, modern age in transportation. Yes, we still are the head of the railroads, but we don't do railroad transportation nearly as much. You all know you get your Amazon stuff either uh, from a truck or an airplane and then a truck. Um, and that, that, that's the means of transportation that we're using today. So the last thing I just wanna stop at the mid-century, uh, we elect Richard J. Daly. Uh, he takes that machine that Cermak had created and he fortifies it. He almost was the longest running mayor. His son, Richard M. Daly, overcomes it. Uh, uh, and he makes what Chicago is today um, he, because he redoes the downtown. Uh, Marina City is built. A lot of the plazas and buildings along Dearborn Street are built. He's the one who tries to have more people come back to Chicago uh, through the, um, initi the new initiative of Illinois Center, which is housing downtown. Um, and he pulls the, uh, the city into prominence, unfortunately, with the um, 1968 uh, Democratic Convention when there's a riot on Michigan Avenue of the National Guard and the Chicago police versus the protesters to the convention. I talk about all the rest of it, but I get, let, let me get to the 2020. Um, prior to the pandemic, we were uh, poised to be a mega city, meaning we were poised to have a 15 million per, uh, person population. That makes a mega city. It would have been the second one in the United States after New York. Uh, what exactly is going to happen? I have no idea. The pandemic threw everything out, predictions, data. It's very, it's very difficult to tell. Um, and I would just like to thank you for listening. I would ask you of those 12 dates, which ones would you put on the flag? You're welcome to put the comments in and I'd be very happy to take any questions.